stories of innovation and success from the vibrant communities of rural Nova Scotia. This is Ignited. Hi, I'm Wade Cleveland. And I'm Amanda Langley. Welcome to Ignited and our special Female Founders podcast series and... I happen to be one. What a, what a coincidence. I know. Amanda, thanks for joining me on this series. You work with Ignite as our marketing guru. I do the social media for Ignite, yes. And with your husband, Adam, you own and operate Super Yacht East Coast. Yes, we're a marine tourism uh, marketing and development agency. We work on marine tourism for the province. So you were pretty excited about being able to do this co-hosting. I am. I think that there's a lot of amazing stories to tell for all entrepreneurs. Uh, and when you came to me about the opportunity to speak about female founders, why wouldn't I be excited? There's so many great female founder stories. There definitely are. And let's tell one right now. We're joined by Dorian Buma, a brain-based coach whose company Create Brain Space is based in the small town of Shelburne, Nova Scotia. She has experience coaching executive leaders, solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, freelancers, managers, and directors. But her journey to that is anything but linear. Dorian, thank you so much for being here with us on Ignited. Let's talk about how a TV producer in the Netherlands ends up as a certified coach in Shelburne. That sounds like a heck of an adventure. Barely any of it was like really well thought out, planned in the head kind of thing. I'm right. very much like a, ooh, that's fun kind of person. And then I kind of jumped that way. Um, but yeah. Spontaneous so, entrepreneurship. Yeah. That's what this podcast is going to be about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, and I mean, if you look back in retrospect, a lot of things make sense, you know, but in the moment itself, it's just like, ooh, that, that's a sparkly thing over there. It looks interesting. I'm going to go that way. I was born in the Netherlands, grew up there. And after a while, I feel like all of my friends, you know, started families and I wasn't there yet. And I feel at some point in your life, you just need the next, the next thing. And I traveled quite a bit and I was like, it would be, be amazing to actually live somewhere else for a while to see how it is to build up a community and build up a career and, and all that stuff. Because when you travel, it's all like, it's very sporadically in short term. Yeah. Um, and I had friends who lived about an hour north of Toronto and I went to visit him just on a vacation. And they brought me to the city, to Toronto. And I immediately fell in love with the city. And I know a lot of people are like, what? You fell like in love with Toronto. Toronto. Exactly. And now you're yeah. in Shelburne. <laughs> now I'm in Shelburne. There, there's, a, there's, a there's a story there. there. Yeah. 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 So I decided that that would be my city. That's where I was going to move to. So literally sold the house, gave away most of my furniture, had a bag of clothes, and... You were alone at that point. You did. I was with, with my ex-partner. Okay. Yeah. So we were the two of us, and he had similar ideas of like, okay, let's let's do this. And yeah, so we kind of moved here with our PR. So we had a little bit of certainty that we would be able to stay here and work here. Um, and yeah, I just jumped on a plane and and moved here. So that was Toronto. That was Toronto. Yes. And then stayed in Toronto for probably about 10, 11 years, and then I had a baby. And I love Toronto, but I feel like Toronto is amazing as long as you can keep up with its pace. And then if you can't, it's really big. <laughs> and I felt Lost like... in the shuffle, that's what they say. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I also felt like my brain space, part of my brain space was taken by my child. And it, it was just harder with everything around me in a big city and the noises and the people. And the, it was just harder to like be calm and, and feel more restful, I guess. What were you doing for work when you were in Toronto? Um, I've done a little bit of everything. So I, my career is the same thing. If you look at my LinkedIn page, it's not like, oh, I wanted to become this. And then I s did all these steps to get there. It's a bit all over the place. I have a bachelor in social work. And then I worked most of my career in the Netherlands in TV, TV production. And then when I moved here, I was like, oh, now what? What am I going to do? I felt like it was honestly one of the most free feeling when I sold my house. I didn't have a phone anymore. I didn't have a car. I didn't have stuff. I just had my backpack full of clothes. And it was like, I can do and be anything, which obviously isn't completely true. But that feeling of like, oh, I can do whatever kind of translated back into my career. And I was like, I don't know. I'm going to do something completely different. And at some point, I needed money. <laughs> and I love tea. So I started working for a tea company that was kind of expanding at that, that point. Um, I worked there for a while and then ended up in advertising, did mostly like operations and that turned into HR in, uh, in advertising. So that's what I did. And then what brought you to Shelburne? Well, first I moved to Shelburne, Ontario 
funny enough. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> You're just looking for places called Shelburne. I know. I guess I was in the wrong Shelburne first. I was like, this is not the one. I need to nope, go to this Nova Scotia. Fit. There must be another one out there. <laughs> yeah. So I was in, uh, so we wanted to move out of the city. And we were looking at like a smaller community, smaller town, and um, found a home in Shelburne, Ontario. Lived there for about a year and a half. And then the pandemic hit. And then I think we were one of the, I don't know how many Ontarians that moved to moved to Nova Scotia, which I wasn't aware of until we started that process. And then you, you found all these Facebook, like Ontarians moving to Nova Scotia. <laughs> it was actually a thing. We moved because um, we wanted, we were really looking for community and we found it really hard to find it in Ontario. We met some great people in uh, Shelburne, Ontario. It's not because of that, but I wanted to settle a little bit. I've moved around so many times, and I felt like I want to move somewhere where You're ready to put roots down. Yeah, where there's community, like the quote-unquote old-fashioned community feel. And I had friends that um, were moving to Nova Scotia, and we're like, oh, that's interesting. So we kind of dug into that. We didn't necessarily pick Shelburne, Nova Scotia, f- because we didn't know anything about it. It's where... Our friends ended up. Oh, um, okay. And and it's eventually where we found a house that we fell in love with, and then we got a wonderful community with it, which is what we were looking for, and been really great so far. Yeah, it's been two years now, and it's been really good. Love it there. It's one of those similarities in these podcasts. There is a a pandemic, whether the business started during the pandemic or scaled or grew or something mm-hmm. stimulated it. That That is a, a commonality in all of these. I wonder, if, I think it's when you go through something big, like a big life change, whether that is a, I don't know, a divorce or a child or a pandemic. Or a business. Or a business. It it just puts things in perspective and you reevaluate what's yeah. important to you. And, and for us, it was, okay, we want to put roots down. We want to have some more space. We want to have community. And, and that's all came together during the pandemic for us. So how did Create brain space start. Funny story, I worked for an advertising company in uh, in HR and that kind of grew and grew and grew and grew and eventually it was part of the executive team, but I was a self-taught HR person. I don't have any like backgrounds uh, in HR. And at some point you get you get to the point where you're like, okay, I can only teach myself that much. You know, I can get to a certain point with Google and, <laughs> and asking questions and things like that and just doing. And I went to see my boss and I what I realized in my executive role is I miss a little bit of business acumen. I don't have a business background, uh, P&Ls, show me how it works, like all that stuff. And I told him, like, I think I need a little bit more education in that front. So I proposed to him, why don't I do some training and then work with a coach myself? And then with that coach, see how we can implement it and then learn that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he said, yes, go for it. Do your thing. Um, So I met with a coach. Her name was Dorothy. And... Um, we made up a, a good plan. I was going to do specific training. She was going to implement, uh, help me implement it in my day to day. And then I remember walking out of her office and I was like, I don't care about the business acumen part. I don't care about the P&L. I want to be her. That's what I want to be. Wow. So I went back to my boss and I was like, how would you feel about instead <laughs> I do coaching and I implement coaching tools and techniques within the company and, uh, and use that in my role? And he said, okay, do he that. He sounds like a great boss. He was a great boss. It's one of the the better bosses I've ever worked with. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. He gave me that freedom. So I started my coaching training at that point. And I did that internally for a while. And then after I, was, I had my baby, uh, I was like, I don't want to go back to the full-time crazy work hours. I want to be able to be more flexible with my work. So I want to start my own business. So at that point, I started Create Brain Space. How does one train to become a coach? Yeah, so coaching is still a little bit like an unregulated job. Like anyone can wake up tomorrow and call themselves a coach. Yeah. Yeah. So there is there is um, the ICF, which is the International Coaching Federation. It's trying to regulate it more and more. And you, will, you see now, maybe years ago it wasn't as regulated, but now a lot of companies will ask for ICF accreditation. So there's different uh, companies out there who offer coach trainings. And um, if you want to do that, I definitely um, say go for one that has ICF accreditation because it it just gets regulated more and more. And it's what people ask for now. So do you work one-on-one or do you go into a company and work with the staff or? I do one-on-one. Yeah, there's definitely group coaching as well. It's not something that I currently offer. 
I used to do mostly um, executive coaching. So I would go into a company where specific executive people were assigned to me as a coach. Now I like to focus more on just individuals. I really love to work with entrepreneurs um, because I feel like they're the ones who don't have a boss to talk to. So it's great for a coach to work with those people. I don't just coach entrepreneurs or just people within a, you know, a work setting, but I do only one-on-ones. Yeah. The entrepreneur group is an untapped I mean, yeah. that's really smart because we often are in silos. Yeah. And, you know, we we just you're kind of going at a thousand miles per hour and you don't have a lot of time to stop mm-hmm. and go, OK, am I going in the right direction or am I just running? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think because you don't have a boss to talk to me like, OK, is this a good decision? Yes or no. Or do I do A or B or how do I deal with I have employees now? How do I deal with a situation with employees like those kind of things? Mm-hmm. Um, it's great to have a coach that you can reach out to, whether it's for a one off or a specific amount of sessions. Absolutely. So being in based in Shelburne, a small rural community in Nova Scotia, mm-hmm. do you do coaching online like via Zoom or? Yeah, yeah, I do a lot of coaching. I'm just wondering how much capacity there is in this area to keep you busy. If yeah, you, if you have I haven't really, to be honest, I haven't really looked super local because my, my clientele has been a lot of times in Toronto still because that's still, where I okay. have the most connections. And for me, it doesn't really matter. They can be anywhere. Well, if there's one thing that the pandemic did was it proved to people that you can be anywhere. You can it work really from anywhere. It really doesn't matter. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And I already did online coaching um, through Zoom before as well, mm-hmm. um, but it has only grown since. And I have to say, I still really love face-to-face. I There's know. something about the connection. You can't replace and... it, but you can su- you can supplement, Yeah, I yeah. feel. Yeah. And that that's the greatest, one of the greatest gifts that the pandemic has, has given us. Yeah, absolutely. Is that you can do And that. to be honest, sometimes there's people who really love, you know, love phone calls because they feel like they can just lay on a couch and have a conversation instead of the face-to-face. Do you want to you know? know what's really weird is that the old-fashioned phone call, where did it go? Now it's either in person or Zoom. Yeah. Like when you want to talk to somebody, nobody says, okay, I'll call you. Mm-hmm. They say, okay, I'll send a Zoom link. Yeah. And I'm like, no, you can just pick up the phone so we true. can still yeah. talk. Or just FaceTime. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be a professional link. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, yeah, it's so, true. that's one thing I find really interesting. So true. Absolutely. I have two friends who still call. I'm like, ooh, yay, they're calling. Yeah, you feel really important. I yeah. <laughs> I like phone calls better somehow. You you get tired of staring at your computer screen, even if somebody else is looking back at you. So Zoom has replaced phone calls the way texting has replaced emails. Yeah, I think that's fair. Right. Yeah, and 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 I... you know, I think whatever you're kind of absorbed in, you kind of crave the other one. Mm -hmm. So I just like an even playing field. When I'm on the phone, I can talk to someone more from the heart than if I'm I don't know, somehow in this, what I feel is a stiff environment of, you know, staring at the little, the little round spot where the, where the camera is. Well, we were talking about this earlier. The the podcasts are a little bit safer that way too, in in an interview setting, because there's not a camera on you. And I think that's why, what I mentioned as well with sometimes clients like to do phone calls instead, because they, they don't have the, oh, I have to be aware of how I look and they're looking at me and they're, like, they're judging my, you know, my movements and stuff. You can just be on a phone call and just talk. Take all those layers out yeah, and just exactly. talk. Yeah, yeah. But if you're an entrepreneur, you may want to consider becoming an Ignite resident. Residency at Ignite will give you the resources, mentorship, and space you need to grow your startup or idea. You'll become part of an incredible support network, a community that's dedicated to seeing you succeed. But don't just take my word for it. Book a tour of Ignite and see what we have to offer you. Go to IgniteAtlantic.com. When you moved to Shelburne, Create Brain Space was already a going concern. You already had the company, right? Yes. Yes, correct. Um, Has it grown since? Um, I think it has, like, I feel like my company has changed so many times because when you first start, you try something out and it doesn't work and you do something else. It's the year of pivoting. Exactly. It's your first year. I mean, the first year, I started in 2018. Uh, 2018, 2019 went really well for a first year. I did mostly executive coaching and then on some separate one-on-one coaching. And then a year after 2020, you know, if in hindsight, if I could have looked in the future, obviously I would have not, not have chosen that, but I decided it was great to do face-to-face workshops. <laughs> and then a pandemic hit. <laughs> so basically all my work stopped. 
because obviously people didn't want to do anything face to face and companies were not interested in investing in coaching because they didn't even know if they still had the money to keep their personnel and their people um, on their payrolls. So it just completely stopped for me for a while. And especially in Ontario, it took so long for things to reopen and things to start up again. It was a year where I had some one-on-one coaching clients, but not a whole lot. It just didn't really happen that much. And then, and then I moved here, so there was a little bit of a break there. And now I finally added the workshops again, because that's something I'm really excited about. And, and I've started coaching again since last year. So I'm just, I feel like I'm just, I have kind of a restart almost. So the workshops, are they groups? Yes. Okay. Yes, they're groups. And then there's always a coaching piece in, uh, incorporated in there as well. And then thought leadership writing is something that just came on kind of organically in that as well. So what, right now I offer coaching, workshops, and thought leadership pieces, the writing part. Okay, so what is thought leadership writing? Thought leadership pieces are like the, I don't know if you know the um, Harvard Business Review, like pieces from from managers mm-hmm. or that write about a specific topic, kind of an in-depth piece about career topics or a piece that kind of provokes you to think about mindset or feedback or whatever the topic is. And at the end, it's, it's, it's kind of to inspire you and to... I was just wondering what the kind of the subject or topics are that you would write a, a piece on. It can be anything. It, it can be anything. It can be about biases, for example, like how, what do biases do? It can be um, messy conversations. Every conversation I have is messy. <laughs> My mind goes in a thousand different directions at the same time, which is why mm-hmm. I fixated on, this is a segue, uh, I fixated on one of the things that you put on your website, which called you the Marie Kondo for your mind. And I absolutely right. love that because I I desire that. I don't have that. You want a tidy yeah. mind? Yeah, I, that would be great. And that's kind of where your philosophies lie and your yeah. coaching lies. Yeah. And I picture you-, you with file folders going into somebody's mind. Yeah, exactly. Things. Exactly. That's what we do. Yes. Um, and I mean, what you just heard from my own, I don't always have a clear mind because sometimes I'm like digging. I can't say that my mind is super organized, but I am really good at helping other people kind of create clarity because there is a lot of information coming away on a daily basis. And sometimes it's really hard to figure out, okay, what, what in all that is really important to me? I love organizing a sp- like a physical space, like give me a closet and I will literally be like, ooh. That's my therapy. Yeah, how can I reorganize it, right? A little bit of OCD here. (laughs) Yeah. So how it mostly works, and you can maybe confirm this for me, is like when you organize a closet, you take everything out first and then you kind of figure out, okay, what still serves me, what does not serve me, where does it need to go? And, And then you reorganize your cupboard and you're either a label maker person or not, but you are, aren't you? Um, Love me some labels. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so what sparks joy in your mind? That's what I'm picturing. Right. You're going, does this spark joy? Does this spark joy? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the Marie Kondo way. So now I know that that doesn't specifically work for the brain. We can't take everything out and then reorganize. And we have and to keep things in there in. that don't always give us joy. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But it is something that I do with clients where we, I call it a brain dump. Let's just dump it all out there and, okay, and then figure out, okay, what's really important in all of that? What's really important? What should we focus attention on? I work a lot with values. What are your values? What are your strengths? And it's all with the reason of creating kind of clarity so you can figure out, okay, what is important to me and what are my goals moving forward? Just because, so it becomes tangible again. If you were going to meet with somebody for the first time, what's probably the most important question you'd ask them to get them kind of on that track? Um, like right out of the get-go, like the, the question where you feel like you'd get the most information. Yeah. What I mostly start with is just trying to understand why you're here. Okay. What is it that you're trying to get out of this? And things change a lot of times as well. Like coaching is very practical. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of digging deep into, you know, what are sometimes there's biases in your way or a specific mindset that needs to change or whatever it is. Um, and a lot of times people set goals and halfway they're like, wait, that's not my goal. No, kind of similar. Goal yeah, so kind of similar to what I had where I was like, I want to, you know, do more training on business specific things. And then when I left my coaching conversation with my coach, I was like, that's not what I want. I want to become a coach. So that's, you see it a lot of times in coaching as well, where it just really shifts. And I really like questions, like a question like, what else? 
because we tend to focus on A, B, and C, and then we stop thinking. But if you also think about, you know, D, E, and F, you can see what your possibilities are. And it's a lot of times way more than what we initially think. Yeah. Um, or questions like what's, what's really the issue or what's really the challenge here. We tend to make things a little easier for ourselves, take the easy way out. I think this is my reason, but when I really think about it, it's actually something else. So I think those are some powerful questions yeah. that you can also ask yourself, you know? Yeah, and how we see ourselves is always different than when you start digging in. Mm -hmm. What we thought we might have needed or what brought us there yeah. is not actually what's leading us to there. Yeah, absolutely. To get the help. And as yeah. a coach, my role is a lot of times to find things that stick out or that if you have a Zoom or if you have face-to-face -face versus phone call is that you can read people's body language. Mm -hmm. I can say in a conversation, like, when you said that, you lit up. Like, your eyes started sparkling or your body became, like, straight up all of a sudden. So what is it in that that makes you so happy? And then people are like, oh, yeah, that's true. That is actually something that gives me energy. Or I've heard you say the same word over and over again in a couple of sentences. So it must have specific meaning to you. Uh, let's dig into that if you're up to that. So that's kind of my role as a coach in that to kind of guide that. You have a very listen. calming presence, I have to say. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It doesn't always feel like that in my head. <laughs> oh, that's okay. <laughs> but I'm happy that it comes across more. Yeah. I often worry about getting to the next stage without really knowing what stage I'm at or even what the next stage mm -hmm. is. So I think that conversation about values and really getting down in the nitty gritty of, okay, what do I want here? You need a brain dump. <laughs> I think maybe I do. Yeah. Yeah. It uh, definitely helps. Yeah. And it's, I, I even do it for myself, like values. And I haven't, it's actually a good reminder. I should do a values test for myself again, because it's been a while. I like to do it because they shift at least in priority for us. They might be the same values, but the yeah. order of their and importance sometimes they change. change. Yeah. It kind of depends. Like... My family has always been important to me, but I would not say that my family values were the number one because I didn't have my own family. Um, but now within my business and in my life, my family is priority number one. So all the decisions that I make as a business owner have to match with that value. If they don't match with that value, then I have to figure out, can I still do it? Yes or no. So it's great to know your values because then if you have to make important decisions, you at least know, okay, they have to match they have to match this. If they're not, then how am I going to deal with that? Yeah, I feel like sometimes as, I mean, this whole series is about women founders, but, you know, some of those labels we throw around, mompreneur, women mm -hmm. founders, some of those really fit within this coaching, like the value system, because all of those roles are full-time roles. Yeah. <laughs> and it's hard to kind of decipher you know, Absolutely. I feel like you have to decompartmentalize each minute of your day. Yeah. Yeah. And it mean, that means making choices. Yeah. And sometimes the choices lean more towards one side. Sometimes the choices lean more towards the other side. And I believe balance is not, you know, the scale being even, but the scale is sometimes tipping a little bit more this way, sometimes tipping a little bit more that way, depending on the needs at that moment. And that that's one thing I've kind of cut myself slack in my own life. And really, I'm all in when I'm in that moment or have that kind of entrepreneur hat on. Mm -hmm. I try to be there. It doesn't matter about quantity, but quality. I try to be in that moment so that yeah. when I'm in those other roles, I'm all in too. Right. Yeah. Because it's easy to be try to be everything all at once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Is there a difference between a female coach and a male coach and their approaches? Is there something specific that you bring to the table because you're a woman entrepreneur? I guess it's a, a bigger conversation about male versus female and a different differences. Yes, we all experience, we all have bring different experiences. And I'm sure that living as a male is very different than living as a female, as is living as Let's a... Let's talk about that. Yeah, later. exactly. <laughs> Let's do another podcast about yeah. male versus How female. How is it different for you? Oh, that could be, that could be a long podcast. I'm, I, you know what I'm thinking where that would come into play, though, is I think, and this could go both ways, but you might be more comfortable speaking with the same sex. Maybe like as a woman, I might want to speak to a woman coach. Yeah, maybe from that perspective, yeah. and then vice versa. I might want a male perspective. Like it just, I think it would 
depend on the person and the sector, maybe. Yeah. That they work and in. And also your experience and, 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 you know, who you grew up with, if you're comfortable. Like, there's so much at play. It's really hard to say, yes, this is the big, this is the difference, or that's what I feel comfortable with. Some people feel comfortable going to a male physician. Some people are not comfortable going to a male physician. I feel like it has a lot female. to do with chemistry. It doesn't really matter on if a yes, person's that man is or woman. True. Because I find like anything, you know, therapy, coaching, bosses, all those things, it really comes down to chemistry. Yeah. And I always tell my, my clients as well, my potential clients, this is go shop around. And we always have a, I always have a free pre call uh, where we kind of chat because I want to make sure that if I'm working with someone that I can actually offer them what they're looking for and vice versa I need to be able to actually help that person or, yeah so it's definitely chemistry is huge so I think that's a good one to mention absolutely you yeah. need to feel like you have that there's people that you you spark with yeah and then there's people that you could you could literally try every single day and it's never going to happen. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. And that's the same thing with like coaching. I tell them as well, if after two, three sessions, you're like, this is not it, then you tell me. And then we part ways. And there's nothing. It's not like uh, I won't be offended. It's just, you know, then there's someone else that might be able to be a better fit with you. That's totally fine. Do you run into a situation where you have it? As, it's almost in like a speed date in a way, I guess, where you say, well, th there's just nothing there. There's no interaction there that, that significantly works. Do you run into that? Yeah, I've had calls, like pre-calls with, with people where I felt like I'm just not the right person for you. Mm -hmm. I've been ghosted. Where, really? You know, where, where people start uh, coaching uh, and then just, just don't let you know anymore, anything anymore afterwards. Um, so, yes, that's very – it's very, very normal and very common um, and – um, Sometimes they're not ready. Yeah. And again, I don't take it personal. I, I like it more if you tell me, like, I don't want to continue, but I understand if that's, you know, for whatever reason, it's not working out. And I also don't find it um, a negative thing if, we, if we're not the right, if I'm not the right fit for you. There's a lot of coaches out there. And I want people to kind of shop around and see who's the best fit. So that when we start, we at least know we're both into this. All in. And we're, yeah, we're, yeah. We're going for it together. Because it's a partnership, right? It's not just me doing the work or the client doing the work. It's a, it's really a partnership. Yeah, for sure. When you're doing coaching with someone specific, how many sessions is that? Is that a once a week thing? Is it a couple of times a week? Uh, how does that work? So it's really up to the client. I prefer at least three because I feel like one is just you just starting to scratch the surface, um, especially because the brain dump, you know, you have to kind of get through all that information. Mm -hmm. So I feel three is the minimum. But if someone wants to come to me, it's like I have a very specific thing. They know exactly what they want. It's also a great challenge for me as a coach to see, okay, how deep can we go right away? And can we figure this out in like the hour? I do mostly do hour, okay. hour coaching conversations. But it could also be if people want a couple of months it's mostly once every week or every two weeks because you also need to allow your brain to make some connections in between. And a lot of the learning happens in between the sessions. Right. Because you talk about things and then they need to land a little bit. And then so in between the sessions is where a lot happens. It feels like exercise. I could be asking you about weightlifting and almost got the same answer. Because oh, yeah. You know that, you to know, let your you, body heal. You have to have that recovery time. You have to have so many a week in order to kind of get those muscles moving. And yeah. I think probably in a way it is that. In that it's exercising perhaps mental muscles that you're not used to necessarily yeah. exercising. Yeah, because, for example, sleep, sleep is when we make connections. And sleep is, you know, in the relaxation part and the, the sleeping part. Like, I don't know if you've ever had it, but you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, oh, and you have this little aha moment. And then you want to write it down because most of the time we forget it by the next morning. That's just your brain making new connections. It's connections, yeah. It makes new, new neural pathways and that happens when we sleep. So yeah, you need to allow your body to make those new connections and, and try things out sometimes as well, and then come back and talk about it. So do you love living in Shelburne, Nova Scotia? I love living in Shelburne, Nova Scotia. No, I actually do really like it. Yeah. We, we bought our house sight unseen. So it was one of those like, okay, we saw it a week before our closing date. So it was a bit of a, well, we'll see if this is nothing, then we'll sell it and we'll go again. But we've been so embraced by the community there it's just been it's been great i have honestly never experienced a more welcoming community 
than I've experienced in Shelburne. So you finally found that community, that sense of real yes. community that yes. you were looking for. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. And I will never say I will never move again because if I do that, I feel like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, that's really overwhelming. Um, but you're happy. But I'm and very content. happy now, yes. And it's a good, good place to be and a good place to raise my child, our child. And uh, yeah, it's awesome. If somebody's listening right now and perhaps wants to find out more about coaching or being coached mm -hmm. by you, how do they do that? Uh, you can go to my website. It's createbrainspace.com. Uh, and all the information is there. Link to my Calendly, uh, emails, all there. Dorian, thank you so much for this. It was really interesting. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. As Dorian mentioned, to find out more about Create Brain Space, visit their website, createbrainspace.com. And you can follow Dorian herself on LinkedIn. To find out more about rural innovation and what Ignite does, check out igniteatlantic.com. We'd love it if you subscribed to Ignited, shared us with your friends, and gave us a good review. Check out past episodes of Ignited here and wherever you listen to podcasts, and we'd love to hear from you. Any comments or suggestions about the podcast or who you'd like to hear on it are most welcome. Our website again, igniteatlantic.com. My email is wade, W-A-D-E, at igniteatlantic.com. Amanda, thank you so much for being here. It has been an absolute blast. We've had so much fun, Wade. Thank you so much for asking me. I'm Wade Cleveland. And I'm Amanda Langley. We'll talk again soon.